Chapter 15, An Introduction to Medical Microbiology. The field of medical or clinical microbiology involves the isolation and identification of infectious organisms and the development of effective ways to eliminate and control those infectious organisms. Medical microbiology is generally divided into the study of bacteria, viruses, fungi, and parasites. Bacteriology is the study of bacteria. Mycology is the study of fungi. Parasitology is the study of parasites. And virology is the study of viruses. Microorganisms can be divided into prokaryotes, which are organisms that do not contain a nucleus or any other membrane-bound organelles such as mitochondria. Or they can be divided into eukaryotes, which do have a nucleus within the cell. Taxonomy is the scientific study of and the classification process. So with any organism, um, it can fall into this classification scheme, which is divided out with different categories. So first you start with life and then you move down to domain, which has three categories, the bacteria, archaea, and eukarya. And then after that, it's divided into kingdom, and then that's divided into phylums, class, order, and family. So within a family, the organisms have very common attributes. Then it's further divided into genus, and one genus can have several species within that genus. And then the species, of course, is the most basic taxonomic group. So here you can see a diagram, um, how it's further divided out. So once you have those domains, those three domains, and then those are divided out within those kingdoms. And so we're going to look at some of these in a little bit more detail when you study um, the different organisms in microbiology. With binomial nomenclature, we break the organism down to the more simpler form, which is the genus and the species. And so with this, the first letter of the genus is capitalized, but it can be abbreviated. So with, for an example, with Staphylococcus bacteria, you could abbreviate it with just an S period. Species names in lowercase, um, they're in lowercase, but they're never abbreviated. So for instance, um, pneumonia would be spelled out either S pneumonia or Streptococcus pneumonia. And so with this, both are italicized. So if you're typing it out, you would italicize it. But of course, if you're writing it handwritten, then it would be underlined to indicate that is the genus and the species. So you will use this throughout your microbiology course. So you need to be very familiar with how you write out an organism's name with the genus and the species. So microorganisms can be divided into normal flora and pathogenic microorganisms. And so with normal flora, these are organisms that are present under normal conditions in specific sites within the body or on the actual surface of the body. In areas of the body with expected microbiota, the host microbiota and the immune system interact to maintain tissue homeostasis in individuals that are otherwise healthy. And so an example of this would be probiotics, so the, the good bacteria that is in your digestive tract. A pathogen is a microorganism that causes a disease. And so the ability to cause a disease is pathogenicity. So a healthcare associated infection or a, a hospital acquired infection is a nosocomial infection or um, in which the patient has been effect, infected during treatment within a healthcare facility. An opportunistic pathogen uh, doesn't usually cause an infectious disease in a person that's got an immune system that is, um, is healthy, but it can cause a disease state in an immune system that is compromised in some sort of way. So here we have some examples of normal and pathogenic flora, 
with different body sites. So for an example, within the intestines, your normal floor would be E. coli and Pseudomonas. However, you can be affected with a pathogen, for example, Salmonella or Shigella. So you may be familiar with Salmonella being exposed to it with raw chicken or undercooked chicken. Um, but also something like E. coli or Pseudomonas could be normal flora in the intestines. However, it is also because of the anatomy of the body can also invade the urinary tract. And within the urinary tract, that would be a pathogen. So there are several classifications of biological agents, um, and it's based on the hazard that it causes, causes to the personnel. So biosafety level one would be a minimum mineral hazard, where biosafety level two would be a moderate threat. And with a biosafety level three, um, this, can, this is more of a threat to the workers within the lab. And so it requires personnel to have a specialized training and to be able to use special barriers to work with those organisms. And biosafety level four is the highest risk. And so this is not in routine laboratories um, because there are risks with aerosols associated with some of these organisms. And so these are go to more complex laboratories to work up organisms like this. Some of the general safety practices that happen within the micro laboratory include waste disposal um, and disinfection, disinfection techniques and processes. And so with waste disposal, it's making sure that any kind of biological waste is handled appropriately and disposed of appropriately. So it can't be put in regular waste trash. It needs to go into a red bin trash can in which it will be taken to be incinerated. Um, and so there may be other equipment that's worked with in order to, to help with some of this process, including incinerators and um, flame burners, although most labs have gotten away from the flame burners just because of the risk. So with disinfection and sterilization techniques, disinfecting is involves destroying the pathogenic organism where sterilization will kill or destroy all of the microorganisms. So with a disinfectant, you know that um, cleaning a site for a phlebotomy procedure would be a type of a disinfectant as far as on the patient that is the samples being collected. And so basically you're trying to destroy anything that could cause harm to the patient when you enter that vein. With sterilization, um, there are a couple of techniques that can be done. It can be done with the use of dry heat, which destroys the bacteria through oxidation, or sterilization by moist heat. And so this destroys the bacteria by a denaturing type, um, by denaturing the proteins within that particular organism. This is the most effective means of sterilization with moist heat, and it involves the use of steam under pressure. And so with this, a special device is used called an autoclave. And here you have an image of an example of an autoclave. And so this is a little bit more of a modern version of an autoclave. And so if you've ever worked with one, it probably looked a lot different than this. And so these are, are used a lot for sterilizing um, surgical equipment that's reused, like scalpels and um, scissors, any sort of metal syringes that maybe need to be reused for anything. And so they would put that in these um, autoclaves with an indicator that would um, be specific for, that would actually let you know that the sample has been through the autoclave process and that it is safe for use. Some other techniques that are used are filtration. And so there are a variety of filtration techniques that are used. There can be a thin membrane filtration, which um, some of the media used in the laboratory 
is broken down during the sterilization process. So when you're trying to make sure that that media doesn't grow um, anything on it with any kind of contaminant that could come in from the air while it's being made. And so some of the media would actually be destroyed or the components in it would be destroyed through, through the sterilization process. So this is a situation where the thin membrane filter would be used to ensure that there's no kind of contaminant in that media because you want to make sure that the organism you're growing on that plate would be what you put on it and not something that come from the environment during, during it being processed. And then you also have the HIPAA filters, the, excuse me, the HEPA filters, which would go um, usually into the biological safety cabinet. And so you can see an image here where the air flows in through the bottom under the sash, and then it goes up through the top, passes through the filter, and then it is circulated out, usually either outside or back into the room. And so um, this type of filter will typically remove about 99% of the microorganisms that are larger than 0.3 micrometers. With the specimen collection for microbiology, it's very important that you understand that there are several factors that come into play. And so you need to be able to ensure that that specimen is going to allow for you to identify the causative agent so that proper treatment can be um, initiated and started for that patient. Specimens are associated with the type of infection. So for example, if the physician suspects that the patient has strep throat, then obviously the tonsils in the throat would need to be swabbed and typically they're going to make sure that the patient hasn't drunk anything um, within a couple of hours before taking that swab, which could reduce the bacteria that are on the tonsils. So um, making sure that the specimen is appropriate for the particular infection that you're looking for. The microbiologist must be aware of the types of infective agents present in the specific specimen type. So for example, with um, stool cultures, you're looking for particular organisms, for example, Salmonella shigella. So you don't want to be overwhelmed with a culture plate that's obviously going to have a lot of bacteria because as we mentioned earlier, um, there's a normal flora that reside within the GI tract. So you've got to understand that the normal flora will grow on the plate as well. So you're not working up the normal flora, but you are looking for the pathogenic flora that could possibly, or the pathogenic organism that could have infected that patient. And for each source of infected material, personnel collecting that specimen must follow appropriate procedures to ensure that that specimen will be optimal. So an example of this would be for stool culture to make sure that um, it is collected in a sterile container. So um, if the patient decides to collect it in a butter dish that they've washed out from at home and bring the specimen in, then that dish could be contaminated with something like yesterday's leftover chicken. So. Um, making sure that that specimen is collected in something that is sterile or has the proper collection techniques is very optimal to ensure that you don't have any sort of contamination or um, misidentifying any organism that could potentially be there. So with that being said, um, specimen collection containers are important because the specimen must be collected in a sterile container, as I mentioned, and it must not be contaminated during transfer to or isolation in the laboratory. So you want to make sure that it doesn't get exposed to anything else that could potentially um, cross-contaminate. Um, so for example, 
um, making sure that a urine culture, when you collect a urine or the patient collects the urine, you want to ensure that that top is secure on that sample because you don't want that urine container to leak out because the top was not on good and spill into the bag, which would contaminate that uh, sample and you wouldn't be able to culture it. So using disposable containers that have been sterilized beforehand through the manufacturer, using disposable culture units, so swabs that are one-time use, you swab the specimen and you throw it away, and also by the use of anaerobic transport system. So with the anaerobic transport system, this prevents air from, um, from the bacteria on that swab being exposed to air for any organism that can only grow in anaerobic conditions, so without air. And so an example of that particular collection system is shown here where there's a gel at the bottom that once the swab is collected, it is placed inside that tube and the swab end of it goes into that gel, which prevents any more additional exposure to air. So with the specimens, it is pertinent that you make sure that it's transported to the laboratory um, in a timely manner because the length of time that that organism is away from any sort of nutrients for it can prevent it from growing successfully. And although many organisms remain viable for a long period of time after collection, some of them are very fastidious and they require a special conditions to grow in. And so um, including any sort of rapid inoculation into a, a form of a suitable nutrients could be um, is something that may need to be done with particular specimen collections depending on what organism you're looking for. Some organisms are so fragile that the appropriate collection device or the nutrient media should be supplied to the patient so that the specimen can be placed directly into the container. So again an example of this would be a stool collection. So typically the patients would be sent home um, a container that looks similar to this, where the patient would collect that stool sample themselves and then place a portion of that sample into this collection pack, which would ensure that um, any of the pathogenic uh, organisms would be still be viable once that specimen reaches the lab. So again, um, making sure that the specimen is handled appropriately is a key factor with micro because sometimes immediate culturing of a fresh sample is not always feasible. Um, so for example, with a patient collecting the stool sample at home, then it may be some time before they can get that into the laboratory. So it can't be cultured right away. But with some organisms, um, a certain conditions of storage aren't appropriate. So it's best to know with the particular culture site that is being cultured to know what organisms will be a pathogen in that site so that you can make sure that it has proper storage. Because with refrigeration, it can actually um, prevent some organisms from being viable once they are able to be cultured. And with freezing, this is typically just reserved for serum samples when there's some sort of serology testing that's going to be performed. And so with that, it could be frozen up to about a week or more or less, depending on the particular test kit that's being used. Only when specimens are properly collected and handled will you get a final a result that a final result that is indicative of that particular culture or that that test will actually be a valid result. And so there are a variety of things that can be submitted to the lab um, for culture. And so this can be blood, body fluids, spinal fluid, um, any other fluid from inside the ear 
respiratory specimens, scrapings of skin, stool, sputum, swabs from various sites throughout the body, urine. You can have various tissue that's submitted. Um, you can also have um, a whole limbs or toes or fingers that can be submitted to the lab for culture in which you would have to actually process that specimen before you culture it. And so there are several procedures that are done within the laboratory when working up um, cultures and determining what the organism is. So you're always going to be aware of the particular culture that you're looking at and what the specimen source is to make sure that you're looking for organisms that are pathogenic to that particular specimen. And based off of different characteristics that that organism presents will help you to classify and identify that particular organism that you're looking at. And then of course, making sure that you interpret any sort of susceptibility with that organism. So this is when you're looking to see if it's susceptible to a particular antimicrobial or antibiotic, antifungal. And so you're looking to see if that organism does not continue to grow once that agent is presented to it, or if it does continue to grow. So if it continues to grow in the presence of that particular antibiotic, then you wouldn't use that antibiotic to treat that organism. And so when you're culturing an organism or a sample, then you are using um, loops or a needle of some sort to work with that organism on that culture plate. And so here you can see some examples of a couple of different sizes of loops, the two blue ones, and then the darker one is a needle. So it's just a, a long straight pointed in. And then depending on the lab that you're working at, you could use potentially use a incinerator. And so most labs have gone to disposable loops, so they do not use the incinerators very much anymore. Because um, obviously if it's disposable, it's made out of plastic and you couldn't put that inside of one of these incinerators. But if you were using a metal loop, you would place the end of that metal loop inside of that little circle. And so it's very hot in there and what that would do would sterilize that loop so that um, any organism that you had on that loop from the previous culture would not stay on that loop. It would um, just incinerate off of that loop and then that loop would be sterile when you go to streak your next plate. Um, the lab in Danville actually has an incinerator that looks similar to this. I'm not sure if the student lab in Richmond has these, but if it does, you may use something like this in lab to help heat fix any slides that you make for microbiology. You can see the attachment at the top of it uh, has a place where you can place your slides to do a heat fix when you make them. You will also use incubators when you're in the laboratory working with these plates, with the culture plates. And so these are set to um, be optimal for the particular organism that you're culturing. So typically around uh, 35 to 37 degrees Celsius. And so within these um, incubators, they have a very controlled environment. And so once the temperature is set on it, then the incubator itself will maintain that temperature. And then it will also have a way to um, introduce or keep it with a three to five percent carbon dioxide level. And it will also maintain the humidity in it because the organisms do, um, they demonstrate an enhanced growth with the CO2. Um, and then there's certain bacteria that do not grow well with CO2. So depending on the particular culture and the organism that you look for will depend on what type of incubator you will place that culture plate in. So most microbiology laboratories will have um, a couple of different incubators. 
And so some will be set to incubate uh, routine bacterial cultures, and then some may be set to incubate fungal cultures. And so just depending on the particular organism that you're looking for as a pathogen will depend on the incubator that you use. So within microbiology, you will look at the features of the particular organism to help you determine what that organism is. And so then it is classified into the appropriate genus and species. And this is done based off of several things. Um, so for example, with bacteria, you would look at how it appears when it's growing on the plate, so the particular plate that it grows on and the features that it presents growing on that plate. You may also look at it under the microscope and see what it looks like, um, how it gram stains, what's its appearance, what's its shape. You may also look to see um, how it responds to different tests, different biochemical tests. And based on all of these together will help you to determine the genus and species of that organism. And so here we've got a chart that kind of tells you the things that you're looking at. So again, you're looking at the microscopic appearance, how it looks when it's growing on the plate, um, how it looks with, so for example, with a stool culture, um, looking at the sample itself to see if you observe any worms that may be present in that stool sample. Uh, with microscopic appearance. So you're looking at how it looks under the microscope. Um, so for a fungal culture, you're looking at some of the different characteristics that the different fungi present with a microscopic appearance. You're looking to see how it stains with different staining techniques. Um, you're looking to see what sort of environmental requirements it has when it grows. So does it require a particular type of nutrient on the auger plate? Does it require um, CO2? So these are sort of things that will kind of help you to determine the particular organism based on its requirements. You could use the resistance profile to help you determine um, which, which organism it is, so how it responds to a particular antibiotic. You could look at an antigen, antigenic type property. So with this, you would use test kits that you would mix that organism with to see if it clumps or not. And so an um, example of this would be to do streptolysin testing for some of your strep species. You could look at other things like its genetic makeup. So there are a lot of things that you could use within the micro lab to help you determine what a particular organism is. So one of the main things that you will do in micro to um, help you differentiate the different bacteria is to look at it under the microscope. And so with this, one of the things that you're looking for is the shape of the bacteria. So if the bacteria is round or spherical, we call this coxa. And if it's starting to divide off in a pair of two, we call this diplococci. Um, with these, with the coxa, you're looking for it to be in clusters or chains or tetrads. And so if you see an organism that fits one of these patterns, then it kind of helps to narrow down the particular organism. With a rod-shaped bacteria, we term this bacilli. And so with this, you sometimes can have some that have a little bit of a curved shape to this. And so we call this vibrious. And then sometimes you have some that are spiral shaped. And so they'll kind of be like a little coral. And so this is a spirochetes. There are a variety of staining techniques that are used in microbiology. However, gram stain is the most widely used technique, and this is done to differentiate the different bacteria. And so what happens with this is you're looking for gram-positive organisms to retain the crystal violet iodine complex, whereas the gram-negative do not retain that complex. And this is due to the difference in the cell wall structure. So with gram-positive cells, they have a thick peptidoglycan layer, 
whereas gram negatives have a thinner layer, so they're not able to retain that crystal violet iodine complex. With this staining technique, after the slot is made and it is heat fixed, and so it's heat fixed after it dries, it's placed on a heating mechanism. So you saw an example of that a few slides back. And after it's heat fixed, you will flood that slide with crystal violet. And so with the crystal violet, um, all of the organisms will stain a purple violet color. And so this is the primary stain. And so if you look at the image here to the right, you can see that they first start off with no coloration to the organism. And then you add the crystal violet and then the organisms will stain purple. And so this is true of gram positive and gram negative. And so once you move on to step two, so you wash off the crystal violet and then you add the iodine. And so when you add the iodine, what this will do is it will help to fuse that crystal violet. And so once it is fixed or retained within the gram positive bacteria, not in the gram negative. And so you've got that fixation that's happened with the iodine treatment. Then what you'll do next is you'll rinse that off and then you'll use a decolorizer, which is a cocktail of acetone and alcohol. And what this does is it will take off that color. So with your gram positive, it's able to hold that within that cell wall. Whereas your gram negative, it will rinse off. And so you have to be careful not to use too much of this because with this step, you can completely remove it or you can have bacteria that's kind of splotchy with the color. And so you wanna make sure that this step is done as instructed once you get into your micro class where you will actually do this technique. And then after you've used the decolorizer, you rinse that off and then you add the saffron. And so what will happen with the saffron is the gram negative organisms will absorb that saffron into that cell wall. And um, this will make the appearance of the gram negative pink, whereas the gram positive will be purple. And so once you complete the gram stain, then you will look at this under the microscope. And so what you're looking for is to see, do the organisms stain purple or are they pink? And so with the gram positive bacteria, you'll see that um, purple color for that particular organism. So it can be a purplish blue color, but typically they're more purple. Um, depending on the organism, some of them do stain a little bit darker. Then with your gram negative bacteria, you'll see that pink color. Um, and then with these organisms too, in addition to looking at the color of it, you're also looking at the shape of the organism. So you may term it a gram positive cocci or a gram negative rod. So you see an example of that here in these two images. With culturing in a sample, then what you're doing is trying to do a dilution type streaking technique. So with this, you would streak the first quadrant. Um, so it's usually a, a smaller area that you streak to kind of start this off. And then once you streak that first quadrant, you will rotate that plate um, one quarter of a turn. And then you will go into that first quadrant that you struck for um, a couple of swipes and you'll go across that that quadrant and you'll start to thin it out so you only go into it a couple of times and then you drag your loop out away from that first streak then you'll rotate your plate again you will streak into that second quadrant and then you will drag it out to try to thin it out. And you'd wanna to try to keep your streak marks pretty close together. And then depending on the laboratory that you work at, some of them do want a fourth quadrant streak. Some of them will stop at a third. But either way, what you're looking for is to get isolated colonies. So with isolated colonies, you're looking for 
colonies that or grow in by themselves, but not in like a large group. So you can see here in the image at the bottom um, where you've got some individual tiny pinpoints. Well, they're a little bit bigger than pinpoint, but you can see some small colonies that are individual. And then you can see where in some of that streak mark where you have them kind of grouped together so it forms a line. Um, in the top image, you can see where some of the different quadrants as you're streaking out, they get a little bit, the organisms get a little bit um, thinner. So you can see in the bottom image as well how that first quadrant streak, you see all of that organism um, growing together in one big group. And then as it, the quadrants turn on that plate, they start getting a little bit thinner where they're a little bit more isolated. So in micro, you could potentially work with a bright field microscope or a fluorescent microscope, depending on the particular stain that you're using. And then with the culture plates, you have primary culture, subculture, and pure culture. So when you culture a specimen, the primary culture plate is what you first inoculated and you do that dilution streak technique where you try to get those isolated individual colonies and with this sometimes it's not a pure culture so in other words there are multiple organisms and so you can see that here um, in this bottom image where you have a mixture of different organisms so you have some that look almost like yeast because you can see the little feet that are coming around that colony and then you have some that are different colors different sizes and so this would not be a pure culture so it's it has multiple organisms within that culture if the colonies on the primary plate appear like they're mixed like in this one and that there's more than one species of bacteria then you'd need to do a subculture or a second culture plate so you would pick one particular organism especially if it's something that looks suspicious. And then you would streak it onto another plate to try to isolate it out away from any of the other organisms. If the growth pattern um, is just a single colony, then this is known as a pure culture. So sometimes you'll, you know, of course, if you've picked one colony off of a plate that has multiple colonies, then hopefully you've streaked it on the plate and then you have a pure culture. So you can see an example up top where it looks like it's just one particular organism that's on that plate. And so that would be considered a pure culture. So once you have streaked your plate for isolation, then next you need to be aware of the conditions that your that the particular specimen site that you're culturing of what organism you're looking for and what growth requirements it may have. And so this may be special nutrients um, that it may need to grow. So you need to make sure that it's put on the proper plate, that it's incubated at the proper temperature, um, that the agar is the proper pH for that particular organism that could be a pathogen for that site, and that your agar plate is sterile, and that it keeps the proper moisture for that organism to grow. And then you're also going to pay attention to the particular oxygen requirements of that potential pathogen because you do have some organisms that are aerobes and they can grow in the presence of oxygen but then there are also some that are anaerobes but they cannot grow with oxygen present so you need to make sure that you do something like um, put it in one of these bags which removes the oxygen from inside that bag, which helps that organism to grow. And then occasionally you can have organisms that can grow in either condition. There are different types of culture media. You have broth media, which is a liquid, or you can have auger, which is a solid. And then you can have some that are a mix between um, having liquid and a solid media. And so an example of this would be a blood culture bottle. So here at the bottom, you can see a blood culture bottle that has a layer of auger at the bottom. 
which the organisms can actually grow on that agar, but then it also has a um, liquid media in there as well. And then you have a tube beside that that has a liquid broth media in there. And then of course you have the auger plates up top, which there you see a variety of different auger plates that can be used within the lab. And so it's important to make sure that all of these are stored to prevent any sort of deterioration of that auger or to prevent any sort of dehydration. So typically your auger is kept within the refrigerator and sealed in a plastic bag so that it does not um, get exposed or to air, which could cause it to um, dehydrate or lose any of the moisture that's inside that plate. You have um, a couple of different types of media that are used. You have enrichment media which allows growth of one bacterial pathogen in the presence of specific nutrients. So if it's a particular organism that you're looking for that requires certain growth, um, growth nutrients, then you would use that plate that helps that particular organism to grow. You have supportive media, which allows growth for non-fastidious organisms. And so this is usually just like a generic type media, like a blood auger plate. You also have selective media, and with this, there is something that's added to it, like a dye or antibiotic or some sort of chemical that will prevent one organism from growing, but will allow another organism to grow. And then you have differential media, and with this, there's something in there um, that will allow a distinctive appearance difference within the organism that grows on that plate. So if it appears one way on that plate, then it can be one particular organism. But if it appears another way, then it can be another organism. And so this utilizes the organism's metabolic and biochemical properties. And you look for the particular characteristics that it presents as. And then when you're looking at the organism on the plate, once you set it up and you've incubated it, then you're looking at the growth patterns. So typically most of them will grow within 24 hours. Sometimes, sometimes they may take a little bit longer, just depending on the particular organism and whether or not, whether or not it's an anaerobic type organism. And so what you're looking for is how that colony appears on the plate. So you may be looking at things like color. You may be looking at things like the shape of it. Is it round? Is it irregular shaped? Um, you will look to see if it's raised or if it's um, convex. Is it flat? Or does it grow down into the media? So these are all different characteristics of the shape of how the colony appears. Is it large? Is it small? Does it have a shiny appearance? Is it, does it look wet? Does it look mucoid? Is it growing all over the plate in one big sheet? Or do you see little tiny colonies that are almost um, invisible to see because they're so small? Does it look dry? Does it look rough? Is it pink? Is it yellow? Is it white? Is it um, off-white? So these are all things that will help you to figure out um, what particular organism is growing. And so here I've got um, some images of a couple of different um, media. And so in the center you have blood auger, which is typically just a supportive type media that's kind of generic. However, um, there are some organisms that will actually use the blood that's in that auger. And so when it uses it, it will um, destroy the blood. So it makes that auger a little bit transparent. And so those characteristics can be visible um, based on the particular organism. And then on the side, you have um, the green auger is an HE auger. And this is considered selective and differential because it is for um, 
some of your enteric or your intestinal type bacteria and with this the color of the colony on the plate so sometimes it can be a black colony versus a um, colony that does not have a color and so that would help you determine what particular organism that is on that plate and then to the right you have a McConkie auger and with this this um, determines the ability of the gram-negative organism to ferment lactose and so with this one only the gram-negative organisms would grow on this plate not the gram-positive we also look at the biochemical or the enzymatic test to help determine um, one organism for the from the other and so with this we look at the um, metabolic characteristics of the organism and so with that we look at things like um, the oxidation of the organism does it ferment certain sugars does it produce um, any sort of co2 does it produce gas does it utilize urea does it produce indole and so with that depending on whether you do any sort of like auger slant that has certain sugars in it like the lysine iron auger or the triple sugar iron with these you're looking to see how it utilizes it um, you can see in the top image with the auger a that particular organism produced a gas and so it split that auger so you can see a little break in the auger so that's indicative of a particular organism um, giving those results and so that will kind of help you narrow down which organism it is and in the top image to the left this would be a coag test and so with this there are certain organisms that have the coagulase factor and so you're looking to see does it test positive for that and then at the bottom you have a a panel that has a variety of tests on it that you're looking at those color changes to determine um, what particular organism produced that pattern of color change the microbacteria or acid fast gram positive bacilli that are obligate aerobic microorganisms so these are a little bit different than the other bacteria and with this they have a cell wall that contain the mycolic acid and so what makes them acid fast is that with the acid fast staining the org these organisms will retain that primary dye and then when you try to use the decolorization on it um, even with using an acid alcohol solution they're unable to um, decolorize and so this is what makes them an acid fast bacteria and so with these organisms you have three main groups which is the microbacterial tuberculosis complex the microbacterial leprae and the non tuberculosis microbacteria and so some of the testing that is done with these um, of course you're looking for these organisms within sputum specimens so you would set this up in addition to traditional media and with this you're going to set up a Lowenstein Jensen media which is that auger slant that you see up top and so this is a little bit different than the plate and so with this it's in a tube that has a slant with the auger and you can see those organisms growing on that slant you also have acid fast stains that are done um, there are a couple of different staining techniques that are done with um, a couple of them you do not require any sort of fluorescent microscope however with the fluorochrome stains you will require the use of a fluorescent microscope um, with any of the staining techniques that do not require the fluorescent microscope for example with your Kenyan method um, this is often referred to as the cold method because it does not require any sort of heat um, 
a heating method to um, make sure that that staining technique um, fuses within that bacteria. With mycology, this looks at um, the different fungal elements, which include yeast and molds. And so with this, you're looking at um, organisms that do possess a true nucleus with a nuclear membrane and mitochondria, whereas, of course, the bacteria lack those structures. And with these, the fungal cell wall is not composed of the the peptidoglycan, and so um, this is what helps to differentiate them from the bacteria. But they do contain an alternate carbohydrate such as the chitin. And with yeast, they are single-celled organisms and they reproduce by budding. So they will actually kind of pinch off. So it will be a round cell that will have like a little darter cell that will attach to it like a little bud. Molds have a basic structure that consists of tube-like filament projections and these are called hyphae. And hyphae continue to grow and then they form um, other hyphae and other different mycelia that attach to them. So they look kind of like um, any sort of like flowering plant. With mycology, um, typically most of these organisms are ID'd by their growth requirements, how they look on the plate, as well as how they look um, under the microscope. And so a variety of techniques are used as far as looking at them under the microscope. Gram stain can be used, but it's not used as often. Um, although doing a gram stain, you could see um, a yeast in a gram stain is pretty obvious. You can also use the KOH preps or the KOH with um, a special dye that helps to visualize it a little bit better. Um, you also can use Indy ink to look for a particular type of yeast called Cryptococcus. And then of course there's also acid fest stains for the fungi as well. And then some of the testing that could be done would be a germ tube test to look for um, true hyphae versus pseudo hyphae. And you'll learn more details about these once you get in your micro class. And then you could also use some of the biochemical um, tests, especially for your yeast, to help confirm what you thought you saw under the microscope. Um, there are also several commercially available identification systems um, that many labs will use um, in addition to how the yeast appears um, growing on a plate or microscopically. So here are some examples of some of the different tests. So in the top left hand corner, you have a Indy ink stain in which you look for the cryptococcal yeast. And so with this one, there is a halo around that yeast cell. So you see a little circle in the center, as well as one that has a little bit of a bud. So you see two circles, and then you see that halo around the outside of that yeast cell. With your top right image, this is a gram stain and you have several yeasts that are in that gram stain and you can see that bud where you have um, one single cell with another cell kind of attached to it where it's kind of making a daughter cell. Then at the bottom left, you have a germ tube test and so you can see that long out pouch of that tube-like projection coming off of that yeast, so this would be indicative of a Canada albicans. Then you also have um, in the bottom right hand corner, you have the appearance of hyphae from a mold species. With parasitology, you are looking at parasites that live in or on the host. 
and this is at the expense of the host. So these are not something that you want within the patient. Some parasites cannot survive without their designated host, while other parasites can exist in a free living, a free living state as an intermediate state before they are actually transmitted to a suitable host. And then there are also others that live um, in situations where the parasite and the host can kind of coexist together without harm of one to the other. And this re relationship can be beneficial to both. So you see this more out within um, nature than you do with um, actual patients, actual people. So parasites as a source of infection, um, it's usually due to um, people who travel to tropical areas as well as um, people that are exposed to different parasitic type organisms um, just in the normal envir environment locally to their home. And because there's so, so much travel of people to other countries, then you do have to learn the parasites that are indicative to the United States as well as some of the other countries because someone could go to another country and inquire a infection of a parasite and then would bring that back home with them. So they would seek treatment once they got home. So you need to be familiar with that particular organism. Sometimes um, some of the specimens that are submitted would include stool, um, blood, you could do a whole blood smear where you're actually looking for the parasite in the blood, as well as it could be serum to do some sort of um, rapid testing technique. It could be sputum, it could be an aspirate from um, any sort of um, body site that may have some sort of cyst or something. It could be tissue, for example, the liver or the muscle. There are some parasites that will invade the muscle tissue. It could be urine, it could be spinal fluid. And so there are also methods of detection, um, which would include doing a wet mount or a direct smear where you're actually um, making some sort of fixed smear. For example, stool specimen, you may would put some of that stool onto a microscope slide and then you would fix it to that slide and stain it and look for those particular organisms. And then you also have immunological type testing. So here is an example of an immunological type test where the patient is being tested for um, trichomonas, which is a sexually transmitted parasite. With intestinal um, ova and parasites, so you're looking for the parasites um, or the eggs of the parasite and the feces. And so you would look at the, the stool macroscopically to see if you see any visible worms that may be in that stool. And then you may also need to look at it um, microscopically depending on the organisms that you're looking for. And so there are a couple of techniques that help with microscopic viewing. And so that could be a concentration type technique where the stool is concentrated to make um, either a saline wet mount or an iodine wet mount to look at it under the microscope. You could um, also do the permanent stain where you dye that slide to see if those organisms are present and they're usually a little bit easier to view once they've been stained. And then there's also um, molecular techniques that can be done or um, any sort of antigen testing for a particular organism. With making a blood smear, you would make a thick smear and a thin smear. And so your thick smear is usually used to screen a larger volume of blood at one time. 
And so you'd put a couple of drops on the slide and then you would kind of smooth it out to leave a, um, a thicker, um, a thicker pattern of blood on that slide. And then with a thin smear, of course, you'd place a drop of blood on the slide and you would push that slide out with that blood drop. And that will create a thinner pattern of that blood. And so this is similar to the technique that you would use to make your hematology slides. And then, of course, you're looking for specific organisms that can invade or infect the blood system. And so here you would you can see an example of a malaria parasite within this blood sample. Virology covers um, viruses. So viruses cannot replicate outside of another living host cell. So the virus actually needs the host or the cells of the host to reproduce. And so what they'll do is enter that cell and it will use the mechanics of the cell to be able to replicate itself. Um, with viruses, they are, the virus particle is referred to as virons and it consists of three major groups. You have the inner nucleic acid core and this consists of either DNA or RNA depending on the particular virus that it is. A capsid or a protein coat that protects the um, it protects and contains the nucleic acid within that virus and then some viruses actually have an outer lipid layer or an envelope and this surrounds the nucleocapsid which is the capsid that contains the nucleic acid and unlike the bacteria taxonomy the viral taxonomy incorporates a variety of categories and so this includes information related to how it's transmitted, um, how it affects the host, the pathology of it, um, the shape and the structure of that particular virus particle, and some other various properties of that particular virus as well as um, how it affects the patient, the disease that it causes. And so there are a variety of different methods out there for detecting virus, viruses. So this could include cell culture. And so there's an image in the center of a cell culture. Um, I don't know that many laboratories will actually use a cell culture. So this is probably more for research type laboratories. You can also do immunodiagnostics, and this looks for antigen antibody type reaction. And so this is how a lot of the rapid kits are. That this is the theory behind a lot of the rapid kits is looking for that antigen antibody detection. Um, so you see an example up top of a flu test in which it is looking for um, usually the the flu antigen, the virus itself. And so it kind of works similar to like a pregnancy test where you're looking for a line. And then you can also have molecular diagnostic testing where it's looking for the virus on a molecular level, looking for that DNA or that RNA of that virus. And it actually, with molecular testing, it will replicate that virus when it um, detects any of those particles. And so you can see at the bottom where um, this technician is doing some COVID testing and this technician is doing the process of um, preparing those samples for that molecular testing technique. 